Hello, hello, welcome everyone to a new conversation of the Altering Shifting Communing Series, a project hosted by Call for Curators. I'm Ilaria Conti, I am the curator of this series, which um, began a year ago approximately, uh, with the intent to create a space to communally discuss the multiple understandings and possibilities of curating. And um, for those of you who might be tuning in for the first time, I just want to um, say that as a series, um, it aims to create, release a space for exchanges and conversations to focus on practices that foster diverse forms of knowledge, that exercise critical thinking, and also that place collaboration at the center by cultivating non-hierarchical and non-normative approaches to the notion of curating. And also very importantly, through this series, we are trying to look at curating also as a system of power that can uh, trigger change on the social, political, financial infrastructures that allow for curating itself to exist. So through this series, we want to address the responsibilities of curating and the importance of considering not just what we do, but how we do it. And um, as I always repeat, in this sense, the title of the series, Altering, Shifting, Communing, is also a statement of intent uh, toward altering the terms of the conversation, shifting ground, and communing with each other. Um, so today we will discuss the work of uh, Casco Art Institute um, with uh, Pina, its director, and its curator, Stacy. Hi, thank you so much to both of you for being here today. Um, Thanks so, for having us. Of course, it, it's a great, great pleasure. Um, I was telling to some friends and colleagues that when we started this series, your work and the work of Casco was really one of the main inspirations and points of density of meaning that we were looking at and thinking about. So I'm very happy that one year into it, um, we have you with us today. Um, in terms of the structure of the conversation, um, again, we will um, talk for approximately the next 40 minutes. And for those who are watching, I encourage really to feel free to ask questions in the meantime through the comment section of Facebook and YouTube. And we will address then the questions during the Q&A mm -hmm. at the end. So again, Stacy Bina, thank you. Um, just to get started, I would like to ask you to introduce yourself in your own words and terms. And also the question I like to start this series always with is how are you and how has this past year or past months uh, been? Stacy, you like to begin? I can, I can begin. Um, yeah, maybe I'll start with introducing myself and then explain how I'm doing. Um, but uh, my name is Stacy Boucher. Um, I've uh, been a curator at Costco since 2017, but my relationship with Costco started in 2015 um, when I visited uh, in the summer for what um, in my graduate program is called a mentorship. And um, I studied at the Center for Curatorial Studies. And in between your two years of study, you select an institution that you would like to do your mentorship at. And I selected Costco. <laughs> and I'm happy that they selected me. Um, and uh, so that was the beginning of the relationship. And um, originally, I'm from Florida. I moved around quite a bit, but I definitely have, like, being a Southerner um, as part of my identity. Um, and in general, my curatorial practice, but also maybe my life practice in general, um, I'm interested in um, relationships and the, the kinds of artworks or practices that are um, born from relationships or inspired by them. And I think that especially, um, well, wanting to do my mentorship at Costco in the first place and then getting to continue um, this long-term working relationship. I have always thought that Costco was the, the kind of um, art space that I could really um, actually work in, that I, it was in alignment with 
you know, theory and practice and also my interest in reproductive labor and care work. And um, yeah, so uh, it's been quite a, an experience since then, which Bina and I can elaborate on in our talk, but um, maybe how I'm doing, I'm doing okay. Um, now that it's a year and a half, I mean, I do, I do miss my family. I haven't been able to see them uh, in Florida for the longest that it's been actually, as of seeing them uh, almost two years. So I, I am feeling a little bit homesick and also in the collective uh, feelings of this experience and the grief that's associated with it. But um, it does allow for a lot of um, quiet and deep exploration um, on many levels. So I think I'm doing um, pretty good, all things considered. Thanks. Thank you, Stacy. Subina. Um, well, <clears throat> maybe I start with that I'm, I'm good. <laughs> It's uh, now I just realized that we both uh, uh, are not Dutch, <laughs> Stacy. <laughs> uh, but we are one of uh, two or uh, six, uh, which makes the team of Casco who do the daily works. In four of us actually based in Utrecht. Mm -hmm. And grew up in the Netherlands, and three of us, <laughs> it's all overlapping from other countries, uh, uh, building long term relationship with the Netherlands. Um, so I came to Netherlands 2003 in autumn to take the curatorial program, uh, take part in the curatorial program at the Appel. So Stacy. Uh, coming from this bar college curatorial background of me uh, from the upper <laughs> uh, and has been director at Casco since 2008. Uh, I came uh, to Casco with much love and affection for uh, each program um, where artists really uh, closely involved and then uh, also community working closely with artists. Mm. Uh, back to how I am. Um, in light of also the pandemic, um, there are a lot of, um, yeah, it's like really, uh, yeah, with mixed feelings. Like in a way, I think we were ready for this kind of moment as a like uh, practitioners. I mean, we here mean also like Casco team, because we 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 have been facing the the world system in crisis. It shouldn't stay like this. And, uh, mm. Uh, so we always place, uh, situate art in the effort for making social change. So however drastic it is, uh, we were ready for this. And this uh, could be, I mean, we partly perceive this as an opportunity, um, mm -hmm. making um, like change faster, uh, making necessary change like really implemented, but at the same time, um, like it. At the same time, like you have to face with vulnerability with yourself and uh, your, uh, I mean, life uh, matter. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, which, um, to the extent that you didn't experience before, uh, like death is very near or imminent, uh, for instance. And mm -hmm. also the formidability of uh, uh, status quo, like resistance to uh, change, uh, change. So, yeah, like 
vulnerability in real sense. So like every day I'm trying to prove myself well uh, and ready for diving into what uh, I and we uh, have been uh, working on. Yeah, that's mm. how I am, where I am. Yeah, well said, Bina. <laughs> this is Stacy. Stacy. <laughs> Affirmative. I'm from I'm from the U.S. So um, that's uh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so very much. So then, mm. we were thinking about the fact that some of the people that are watching this might not know Casco as an institution or not very well. And so we decided to somewhat take it from the beginning, um, mm -hmm. just because it, it's interesting also, as we were saying before, to understand what the narrative is or how it, it has been changing and so on. And so just, as I said, starting from the beginning, I wanted to ask you very simply, how was Casco born? And also in response to which needs and urgencies the organization was created. I know that you were not working there at the time, but somewhat sort of, where do you see the root of the institution, mm -hmm. no? where you're working mm -hmm. um, now and how has it evolved perhaps also since you have joined respectively, no? Uh, mm. Casco. Casco, since the beginning. I mean, maybe maybe I can start with this, but Bina, elaborate um, as you want to. Mm -hmm. um, because I, like Bina and I were also talking about this too, of just uh, the, the scale of Costco um, and the, the ability and opportunities for Costco to respond to the times that it's in in very um, direct ways, but also, um, yeah, also intuitively and able to yeah, I guess, um, uh, adapt. But um, Costco started in 1990 um, by a group of artists, uh, female artists. And, um, and I guess like we could also characterize Costco well with the different name changes that happened over time that I think are also quite reflective of the different life cycles that Costco was having. Mm -hmm. um, in the first place um, being Costco, Costco projects, and more like, um, you know, the, the artist collective formalizing itself into an organization of presenting uh, artist work. And then, um, you know, Costco Office for Art Design and Theory, and, you know, finally Costco Art Institute working for the Commons. And I think, um, or what I have been able to understand of Costco's history is that each of these moments were responding to well, like the different sort of contemporary art movements, um, you know, since the 90s, um, more community-based art practices, relational aesthetics, um, but then into the rise of um, internationalism and globalism um, of the early 2000s. And I mean, and, and more as well, but maybe Bina, you can elaborate a little bit on these life cycles or so, or what do you think? Um, yeah, um, we actually still in touch with uh, um, like the, one of the founders and those who uh, worked at Costco in the early nineties. Um, so they are like active in the field. Um, one became museum director, the other one now working as an independent curator, as a teacher. Mm. Yeah. So there is definitely, I think, informality at Casco, although it didn't start as an artist-run space. Uh, but as name says, uh, <clears throat> uh, there was, I think, uh, certain awareness about the placing art in public space. Mm. So like after five years of experimenting with the storefront space in uh, Utrecht city center, it uh, moves into this space uh, uh, 
where uh, program structure in three parts. So one was uh, project, so then space use as a office and platform and reflexive space, while project uh, public, real public moment taking place in public space. Um, and then two other uh, pillars were uh, publishing with mm -hmm. issues, and then third one, uh, salon. So this uh, gathering. So I say this like mid 90s mm -hmm. became like the, the really create matrix for what Casco is and how we do them. Mm. Then, <laughs> I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking how, how lengthy I would go <laughs> about this, her story and, and their story. Maybe to mm. make it a bit more exciting, uh, things got really messy, I came on board. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Maybe rightfully because it was 2008. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, just, just before I came, Casco was very uh, still like integral. It's like a team of uh, two or three, so very light, mm. agile, and uh, commissioning doing uh, uh, five or six projects per year. And then it started expanding because director then Emily Patrick also from uh, London. Uh, so there are more like international collaboration. But as I came in, <laughs> it was also when the, this uh, financial uh, crisis uh, happened. So mm. like, like there was this uh, sense that we can't take for granted what has been there. Somehow condition uh, has been uh, shifting. <clears throat> so then I thought uh, we should connect this more relational uh, community involving or participatory works with artists. Uh, we need to situate this more in the broad uh, social movement, connect mm -hmm. with uh, other organizations who are uh, working on the same issue, but yet without uh, artistic aspect. Uh, so, uh, a project called Grand Domestic Revolution kind of born out of that interest. Uh, uh, and like we start uh, this, this uh, order or rhythm of uh, doing one project after another, uh, start breaking in. And there was this like long-term massive collective uh, process uh, start shaping the institution. But then mm -hmm. the massive revolution, um, like basic idea uh, is like, like uh, social structure is much embedded in uh, privateness and private space and uh, a change could, could begin here. So if we are, uh, envisioning more like uh, more yeah I would say communal let's say we're common based uh, society at the time we didn't use this word uh, mm -hmm. commons. Um, uh, then this could be uh, a site for change which we can begin with then we uh, starting on uh, uh, housing situation. So that was exactly so 2010 11 uh, was when uh, spotting has been uh, illegalized. So, like, there were uh, demonstrations uh, uh, up, up here and there, which you couldn't see before uh, protesting against it. Mm. Plus, um, yeah, the law passed. So a lot of like sporting community uh, were evicted uh, since then. And also the domestic workers and cleaner, mostly coming from uh, former, like, former 
uh, former colonies of, uh, of the mm -hmm. Netherlands mm -hmm. and uh, other part of the global south, uh, hence often with uh, no uh, legal document to work and live, uh, but they were uh, uh, recognized by a uh, union in the Netherlands and they start also um, started collective action for demanding for recognition of their work. Uh, as uh, valuable and needed work in the Netherlands. Um, so, um, yeah, then we start involved in this like squatter scene and uh, uh, domestic workers movement and uh, like migrant uh, movement. Mm -hmm. Do you hear me? Yes, we lost you just for half a second, but luckily you're back. So with this randomness revolution, there was this kind of environment, uh, like uh, messy uh, relational growth. And hmm. what uh, I think held us is this apartment that we rented. Hmm. <laughs> so, hmm. Uh, we had this 50 square meters apartment uh, uh, close to our office, uh, mm -hmm. at the same time function as gallery. And uh, like life work also started then mingling. <laughs> Relationship uh, of uh, uh, staff and artists, uh, other collaborators also start uh, mingling. and. Mm -hmm. That led us to uh, 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 yeah to planning that we should move. We can't stay at the office at, at in an office place, but we need somewhere more like home, <laughs> where mm -hmm. we can cook and where we can and sleep and cultivate this relationship uh, or this mode of relationality further. Uh, an outcome is where we are um, uh, in the city center in a bit like intimate courtyard where we moved in 2014. But it's not apartment. <laughs> so we couldn't find such a uh, <laughs> place. But we instead moved to a formal um, school building, mm -hmm. which until like 18th century hosted um, Catholic convent where nuns were leaving. This is... I was thinking that um, Grand Domestic Revolution is like a, like a foreshadowing to this more like this maturity that Costco... Maturity, is that the word? I mean, like how, how, we've, how we've grown. Um, mm -hmm. And it also makes me think about how recently we were fantasizing about like, oh, we need to just buy a house and land. <laughs> that was like a recent, a recent fantasy. Mm -hmm. So our location now is, yeah, it's not a place to sleep and, you know, live too extensively, but at the same time, it's a, I think a really important place for us now. And also of what we're able to cultivate there or you know, uh, what we're able to uh, explore with the commons and deepening our understanding of the commons by really taking the place that we're in at the moment. Yeah. Which in a way leads me to my next question, um, as, which is about the commons. Um, so you said that a few years back in 2018, um, sort of the name of the institution, mm -hmm. the organization broadened no, Casco Art Institute working for the commons. Mm. So I wanted to ask you, since this notion is so central to the vision and the activities and the programs and the infrastructure of Casco, I wanted to ask you whether you could tell us more about how you are interpreting or thinking this notion of the commons, perhaps at this point in time, because I assume it's something that grows and expands and changes over time. But so far, and standing from where you are, uh, standing where you are right now, I guess, in time and space and 
in your process of yeah. research and experimentation, how how are you thinking? How do you interpret the commons when thinking about mm. working for the yeah. commons? I mean, over the past few years, it's been a struggle to um, articulate it, or you know, a part of our goal of working for the commons is in a way popularizing what it is. But the commons is like. There are, that's just one word to describe um, um, certain like concepts and practices. There are many other words for it. Um, but um, maybe I can have like a little definition or just a kind of simple way of how we um, define it, mm -hmm. which I like wrote this out just to make sure that I don't ramble on. <laughs> but um, so, I mean, there's many ways, but like, what we've also explored within the team and also the artists that we're working with, but and, you know, the many other kinds of practitioners that we work with, it's an important conversation point of talking about it because once we um, have more of a shared understanding, that's when, um, that's when the, the magic happens in a way or that there's like, the, the beauty and joy um, opens up for what we're able to do together. Um, so maybe in short, um, to say that um, in a simple way, that the, the commons are our resources. And the, this can be like land, um, which is like the most tangible um, form of the commons. Um, it could be knowledge. It's, it's also relations. It can also be art. But it's um, these resources are cared for and maintained and shared amongst a group, but a group that specifically um, commits to those resources. So, I mean, it, an example could be like a neighborhood garden. It could also be something really specific, like a lesbian farming commune, or it could also be even more specific, um, but hard to grasp for many of just particular ecosystems that are, um, um, vital um, to sustaining life or, or um, well, in many ways, many life forms that are under threat of extraction or profit. And then, you know, these are usually regarded by land stewards or protectors. And we also know this more of, um, of many indigenous people, the ways in which they value land. Um, but it can also be advocates. Um, you can also think of different cases of, um, particular ecosystems that, you know, in the same ways in which corporations um, can have a sort of personhood, um, that there's been more efforts and advocacy for particular ecosystems to have like personhood or, or protectors. Um, but specifically like the fruits of the commons are um, considered important to be cared for. So whatever is coming from that commons. So we can also see it as like a collection um, a house, land, but it's uh, it's not just about that. It's about how it's cared for and maintained since there's like many ways that that could be done, you know? So, but with the commons, it's challenging the systems of public and private and, um, you know, it's not the only ways that we can regard like how we live and organize and govern life. Um, so it's the group, the commoners that are, um, that are caring for those resources are the ones that determine like the ways and forms of that care. And then the governing principles and code of conduct or conditions. Um, so this is like a, a small explanation of the commons, but there are many more. And there's also many ways in which we're engaging with it, um, you know, directly from, from Costco and like within Costco and our ecosystem or networks of people that we work with. I hope that was more or less um, um, like clear and bite-sized. Maybe what I what I could add um, is um, working both with a very narrowly defined concept of commons as uh, um, like operation attached to this uh, common resource and uh, working with, with really like broad a notion of commons, almost meaningless, however situated mm. in this uh, private and public dichotomy that 
uh, has been structuring the society over like like since Rio or like even 500 years ago, uh, you could say. Um, so when we take with this broad notion, uh, like it is uh, to undo, uh, uh, there is only like individual or individualistic way of living and working that you uh, constantly create your um, uh, like claim ownership and, and then put the boundary on and accumulate what you own so, uh, uh, on and on and use uh, or build a relationship with the public as authority to uh, mm -hmm. to actually guard this property or ownership that uh, um, uh, claimed by individual interests and um, mm. yeah, so like uh, the way uh, the way uh, city is uh, uh, shaped these days and the way that we as an individual, human being uh, spend our life uh, if mm. you firstly it's all down to this private and public dichotomy but then mm. the joy of life we gather from that is not private and, and uh, that is neither private and public mm. you is in this moment when you have a coffee with your colleague in company and and start uh, brainstorming or start uh, sharing about the life burden that you are struggling with. So that's uh, like commons within mm. this uh, private uh, corporate structure um, as an instance. Um, and then in the city, like, uh, how much we know, how much relationship we have actually with our uh, neighbors. But mm -hmm. when, when uh, there is open relationship with your neighbor, there's so much, uh, uh, yeah, so much, um, yeah. It's it's a it's both a safety net, but at the same time. Yeah, safety net, but it also enrich your uh, life quality. I would include also uh, like uh, nature here. Um, uh, that when when your uh, it's not just urban setting with uh, cement and uh, concrete blocks, but when you are sharing space with other like non-human uh, agent, non-human being. Uh, Hmm. Also, how your uh, life uh, gets alive. Um, mm. Yeah, so I'm going far with this notion <laughs> of uh, uh, commons. But again, like let's come down to the na uh, narrow, just be clear notion of commons that is uh, sharing resource together with uh, with care of each other. Thanks. Thanks to both of you. So then starting stemming from this understanding or possible understandings, um, the question arises, which is how are you shaping the programs, the contents, but also the processes mm -hmm. and the infrastructures mm -hmm. of Casco around this understanding of what commons is. And also if you have mm -hmm. any um, example that that you might want to share, either at the level of programming and content, but again, very much also of the processes and infrastructures, if you would like, just to understand how you are further grounding, no, this work for the commons uh, and not just on the commons, which I really like. Um, but uh, yes, 
I was I was thinking because I wanted to respond to Bina, maybe it could be a bridge because um, thinking about like narrow concepts or definitions or like examples of the commons in practice or maybe the kind of fleeting moments of where it's actually happening. Um, you know, um, I think that the, the under commons by Fred Moten and Stefano Harney is of course like, um, that was a inspiring kind of text at a particular moment in time for Costco. I mean, and still, um, because, well, a few things, but it made me think about how, well, what they're talking about of the sort of learning and education and what they call study that happens like outside of the classroom within the university, like the institution. Um, and so, yeah, maybe as like a, like a short bridge, I think maybe we can talk about study lines um, as a part of um, the program that when, when um, Costco Art Institute working for the Commons had its inaugural, inaugural um, yeah, the, the, the name change and also the institution changed a lot, the graphic identity, there's quite a shift. And one of those important shifts was um, implementing and making visible also something that's still really messy for us, but what we call study lines. <laughs> um, yeah, you I could keep to... going, but yeah, maybe Vina, if you, if you want to share a little bit more. <laughs> Uh, I think my my um, theme of today is the messiness. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Funny, I'm talking something that I didn't really talk in uh, a public, but we mm. we joined this that Stacy talked about uh, this that um, or. Um, that is uh, institutional strike. Hmm. <laughs> so after running uh, the program on the commons, about the commons, uh, I think that was also like when we were most rich in terms of uh, budget, like fund funding outcomes. We had like several commissions and a few experimental like collective uh, research groups. Um, but uh, after running this program on the commons for composing the common between 2013 and through 2016, mm -hmm. we came down to like, uh, are we uh, practicing the commons and the, this institution actually mm -hmm. enable this practice? Mm -hmm. And we like working in this constant contradiction. Mm. But there was also always like, what's the wrong with contradiction? You just do your service that, uh, you know, like providing certain knowledge about the commons. But I think this contradiction became unbearable. Um, uh, so the team was almost like breaking down. Mm. Right? I think I was also about to leave. <laughs> um, but like so few of us uh, decided to remain, but uh, uh, take up uh, this task of uh, change, uh, transform the institution. We'd hope mm. that institution could be a place where we can be common. At that time, mm -hmm. we uh, like took sense of this business mm -hmm. and the uh, concern, this like anxiety that you could have as a worker and producer, which uh, we could find also as a general uh, like social uh, phenomenon uh, as obstruction to harmony practice and what's at the core in common practice then we understood as a deep understanding. Mm. Later, mm. We were almost simultaneously by reading the undercommons, then we start calling 
that deep understanding uh, study. So we were saying actually like uh, for ourselves, but also uh, for our public, we don't really allow this space for study or mm -hmm. deep understanding. There is this mandate for production or project and or exhibition, and then that just runs one after another. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's how we uh, took study as really like the center uh, in the process of tra transforming Casco, uh, not just about the commons, but uh, for and uh, of the commons. But mm. then it became uh, a monster, new monster. <laughs> this is what Stacy actually can tell. So <laughs> how study became a monster and how it became center, but uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, so as Bina said earlier that in the past year during the pandemic, there's been a lot of changes for Costco, but also um, there was a lot of changes happening around us that we have also been advocating for. So it, um, uh, anyway, but um, so there's a lot of different changes that are happening in the institution now, which maybe we can talk about in a bit. But but first, like responding to what Vina was saying, that like from 2018 to you know, um, I guess the end of 2019, let's say, um, we were like uh, fully starting our new institutional structure that had very particular elements to it. And one of those those like program features was to have a biennial exhibition program. And this was in a way to, um, yeah, speak to the, like uh, have the, let allow the study lines to speak in a way, because the ways in which we had, I think maybe seven or eight study lines, six to seven study lines, that were touching on all different sort of themes. So they were kind of addressing different domains. They, they were just about different different things. And Stacey, so, can you give yeah. us some examples for those who might not know what you're referring to? Yeah, so, well, I mean, maybe it, we could even say like, um, they're like projects, <laughs> you know, but we were calling them study lines to show also this different process that's happening that's a collective one and is also in pursuit of this deep understanding. Um, and for example, a site for unlearning the project with um, the shifting Costco team for a few years and, and the artist Annette de Kraus. Um, this was a like a Costco project that became a study line because it's a process that's ongoing and and study lines for us were I think how we started to organize them is that uh, each one from the team kind of set up their own study line so that the program could sort of breathe in and out of these study lines. Um, Another example is like um, Unmapping Eurasia um, that Bina initiated, which is exploring the kind of artistic and cultural imaginary of, of Eurasia. And um, for example, um, myself and uh, Rizvana Bradley started Poetics of Living, which is looking at uh, non-normative um, ways, like poetic and artistic ways of thinking about um, health, sexuality, communal life, and death, which maybe I could also respond a little bit of how like study panned out for me with that one. But um, so anyways, the program feature of having biennial exhibition program was to also try to share artistic presentations related to the study lines. But the struggle with that is that they they, it was still stuck in the production cycle of like a new presentation, then it's over a new presentation. And it it's not actually um, able to demonstrate the ongoingness of the study. Um, mm -hmm. It's moments like little glimmers, moments in time where you can um, see like maybe um, a more autonomous individual artist kind of commission. And then you can also see collective um, uh, 
practice in action or with like non-artistic practitioners or kind of mix. Um, so yeah, I think that the struggle or the monster of that is that um, it wasn't able to effectively demonstrate uh, the study. But now I feel like in this last period of the year that we're able to shift a bit where it's a bit more like walk in the walk and then it speaks, um, it speaks. I mean, I, I can say, and as it also relates to, to my curatorial practice, poetics of living is like um, the start of something which actually inspired me in 2019 to start um, hospice work, to become a volunteer, you know? So that was like, yeah, Poetics of Living also inspired, it was like a, a step before that. And then that's a practice that, that then is feeding back into thinking about future artistic projects. So now, you know, for, for um, in the next couple of years, there, there will be one um, related more to end of life care. But it's, it, yeah, for me in, in a life practice way and also the curatorial practice, was a way in which now study and study lines are doing something different for me. Um, yeah, that's just like a little vignette, but I think like the monster is like less of a monster now because of other sort of changes at Costco. Yeah, we are out of, out of, we, yeah. We are <laughs> with our monster, maybe monster <laughs> is there. Uh, there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we know where and how to play with a monster. So uh, yeah. actually, because Larry, you asked me about the like compromise, whether whether we are not making compromise in relation to changing uh, culture mm. policy and then mm. fundings. But uh, yeah, it's strange. I never thought uh, certain strategy that we take as a compromise, but maybe it was a compromise. So we didn't want to do exhibition. <laughs> Actually, like desire was like stop uh, doing exhibition. But then we thought uh, we are focusing this much on uh, study lines and studying. Then at least we should have something to give as a service, uh, something that works in mm. public level. Mm. And exhibition should should work. <laughs> and the regularity of exhibition also should work. But in the end, we were only learning that it wasn't really a good move. Uh, mm. after something that we learned from it. Uh, so we are living away from uh, uh, exhibition being main strategy. Yeah. And the, but still there was really like, I think beautiful outcome from this focus on study and study line and something that Stacy just uh, also mentioned. I didn't know that your hospice, work at hospice is coming from critics of living. So one condition, kind of condition, like we were asking, yeah, what, what we can bring as a study line and anything that you are interested in, I mean, like mm. we should, uh, be careful, it doesn't become another like intellectualism, um, mm -hmm. like subject for your PhD. So yeah. it has to be deeply connected to life matter. Also, there should be constituency. It's not your thing, but there there is community who share yeah. this concern. Um, so through this, uh, like, I think there is, there has been transformation in uh, in work and mm. work relationship. So, mm. uh, yeah, Stacey and me, like, uh, yes, officially we are in uh, work relationship and certain hierarchy uh, by different factors. But yeah. me, like before and after all of this, Stacey is practitioner in this and that. Thing. So one is like they are working at hospice and they are really invest in this uh, matter of life in relation to uh, different approach to dying. Um, um, mm. So uh, that uh, also 
enable us to really uh, practice in ecosystem mm. and institution made up of ecosystem. So it's not made up uh, of uh, workers and the public that we need to give service, but mm. it, it is a bunch of practitioners. But again, like we shouldn't forget there is a limit in um, it's, I think, legitimate limit, uh, like uh, circle of uh, commoners uh, can accommodate. Mm. There is always public, uh, or there is other commons. So mm. how do you communicate with these other commons that you are a part of and, and the public? That's, I think, we are finally getting uh, equipped to know how to communicate and, and that's what we are working on now like we reconciliation between yeah. commons and the public and and bina and um i think that this is also a really nice segue of thinking about assembly mm. um because uh, as part of the um the the change um the one important program element was to um, organize our annual assembly. And this is a, a chance for many of the different um, uh, members of our ecosystem. And this is also, I think, greatly inspired by um, Arts Collaboratory and the project mentioned before of Site for Unlearning with Annette Krauss, that uh, assembly is the, the chance for everyone to be able to get together and convene even though they're coming from separate places and of different concerns. But for us, assembly, um, now this year is our fourth one. <laughs> um, but with assembly, there's always um, a task at hand. Um, I mean, it features like um, program elements as you would find maybe in a symposium or so, but there are many aspects to it that are quite participatory and really rely on active engagement. They're, they're, the program, the assembly itself is informed by everyone that's being part of it. So there's always a task at hand and something to address together. Um, and so I think that like, especially from the institutional change of 2018 and where we're at now, this uh, assembly is also in a really important case for how we are able to do this practice. Yeah. There's a, yeah. <laughs> That's the end of my current thought. <laughs> I've learned recently that it's a, it's good sometimes in these um, live stream settings where it's like you're talking and then, you know, then you say, okay, I'm finished speaking. <laughs> so someone else. <laughs> Anyways, but yeah, I could go on about uh, assembly, but I, I just wanted to add based on also what Vina was saying. That this is a, this is an important part of Costco. Well, you mentioned site for unlearning among the study lines, mm -hmm. and I had a question about this um, mm -hmm. because um, I was reading about it, of course, online, and I um, saved, I noted down sort of the small definition that was there mm -hmm. as a study line, and I'm reading the questions and changes embodied knowledge and organizational patterns and habits from the perspective of the commons, taking art organizations as exemplary sites. And I was struck because of course it is in great resonance with Alt-Shift-Com as a conversation series. And so I wanted to ask you just even briefly, but whether you could tell us a little bit more. And you mentioned that this study line among others, of course, but also contributed to this transition and change of CASCO that you've been referring to. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you also how, not only what in a way, but mm -hmm. as we said before, how has it contributed? Like what, it was a trigger or a spark for what in a way, in your opinion? It, it was how it was triggered or what it was triggering. What's your I think both, like mm. how it has affected change 
but also what kind of change, mm. uh, what kind of process has it set in motion and but of which kind also, no? Like what's happening thanks to this? Yeah, in a way I already mentioned um, uh, that, but without, uh, without saying that it was a part of a cycle of learning uh, at organization with uh, Aneta and the team. So this desire for institutional strike uh, mm. is something that we arrived with this program. Uh, mm. The fear by uh, cycle unlearning at organization, but also arts collaboratory as well. So it's not there is just this project and this project caused us to uh, uh, mm. Mm. Uh, change. But um, yeah, as we say, embodied knowledge, and I also see this consistent line that we uh, we have this uh, uh, critical, ongoing critical question or caution uh, against uh, knowledge, learning, and study, mm -hmm. and how we can uh, genuinely have meaningful life where we actually are learning because there's so mm. much learning for learning shake. Uh, yeah. This private and public dichotomy in order to survive and fit in uh, this uh, structure. Um, um, yes. <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> Stacy, you like to, is there anything that you can? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Um. Cleaning and cooking. Uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, that's why I think cleaning and cooking is really like the fundamental to to this. Uh, cleaning, yeah. like emblem symbol of the reproductive reproduction and maintenance and care of life and relation that keep uh, sustain um, life on. Yeah, um, with Cypher Unlearning, um, there were these multiple exercises that Aneta and the, and the team were doing. And yeah, I also think about this a lot with the, um, the exercise uh, to unlearn, well, the busyness of the office team that makes it so that, you know, there are certain people that are always doing the cleaning and cooking. And so part of that exercise was to, um, you know, each day when we were uh, in the, the working in the office, now it's a bit of a different story, but um, each day, it, you know, there would be this rotation of um, who's doing the cooking. And then, um, then after our weekly team meetings, that's when we would clean together. So we would also divide up the tasks and then be able to do it at the same time um, most of the time, but, um, yeah, this, uh, I, I wonder how we will be able to, um, revitalize these maybe in this current kind of time that we're, we're living, but in any case, it's, um, I think that as Bina was saying, cleaning is really maybe the most, um, yeah, material, like symbolic and material, um, practice that is just so vital for thinking about either like you know a house as a as a commons or the earth as a commons like the micro and macro scale and in general the types of well labor and knowledge that are just you know is undervalued so um yeah i think that this is something there were many other exercises from site for unlearning but these are the two that i think are the most long-standing and then you know um in the unlearning exercises publication that was also launched in 2018 um you can learn more about those those other exercises which are also very equally important to to the process i mean it's also thinking about like unlearning property and um, many other kinds of unlearning mm -hmm. well stacy like cleaning wise you were like intensively working on uh, cleaning archive. So yeah. like cleaning um, 
Yeah, cleaning and caring for. Mm. Yeah. This is a, like a this is a big interest of mine being at Costco because yeah, I think it's the Costco her story and the regenerative process of Costco, the kind of like maturation but like the growth degrowth of Costco that is also really um, visible within Costco's like archive or collection or library. But so how we're doing it now, I mean, it's not only about making a bit more like clear and accessible, the archive, but also demonstrating more how they, these are resources also, <laughs> like quite, yeah, quite practically, they're resources for us that we care for. So, I mean, within our library, um, there's also particular collections. There's the Grand Domestic Revolution Library within the library. There's like also a quite dynamic site for unlearning um, project archive filled with all sorts of bits and materials. So, um, and of course there's so many um, publishing endeavors of Costco of the past 30 years. So yeah, right now, and also in this kind of, you know, 30 year moment that, that has become I think an important element because it's also to say like this is valuable that Costco is precious and and it's um, worth taking care of these things and also for the future. Definitely. <laughs> and um, I'm like, I, <laughs> yeah. Well, I just wanted to show you because I guess that the conversation yeah. also triggers further. Uh, like the possibility to deepen further. And so yeah. um, I was looking at the questions that we received and I oh. said I would wait for for sort of the Q&A, but since we're about to run out of time, I have one last question, but before getting to that, which which would be a little bit of a lateral shift, I just wanted to ask you this question that came in from Lina, which is very relevant to what you were saying. How do you conceive the relationship between production, including knowledge production, and reproductive, reproductive sorry, work, care work, in relation to the common to the commons? And then the question continues. Mm. And in the same vein, mm. visibility and representation and invisibility. Absurd an amazing question. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, I don't know if you have more, any of you would like to add more to what you just shared about cooking and cleaning and all of this, and, or more. Mm. Well, gosh. I mean, just one, oh, yeah. No, no. One, one, like, a short thing. I mean, just even thinking about how, um, yeah, reproduction makes production possible, you know. I'm thinking about that. Um, and I'm thinking, I, I think that question is really great. And also this um, visibility, invisibility part. And it's also a question I'm asking myself a lot too. Um, and, and for me, um, it's sometimes a question of like naming or like what, what is made, what is understood and made visible to, um, to everyone involved not everyone, but everyone involved, if what that means. Um, it, I, so it's not really an answer, but I guess I'm kind of echoing the question of, of um, this like visibility or naming or not only deep understanding, but shared understanding. Mm. Do, you, do you have a thought, Bina, about that? Um, I because I was just uh, thinking that how a great word would be that everything becomes less visible. Mm. <laughs> uh, but then paradoxically that we are working intensively on uh, visibility and we yeah. say that it is a joy for uh, joy in making what has been invisible visible. <laughs> Hmm. But maybe it's just hmm. uh, it's a it's a more about time. So hmm. uh, it takes time. Uh, eight comments uh, get um, mature to be ready to work 
with other commons and mm. work toward the public. Mm. The thing is how much resilient this vulnerable commons is in order to endure this moment uh, uh, of not visible, not really like public, uh, why uh, uh, many of uh, resource that is necessary for living that include monetary resources mm. go to uh, like being public and, and visibility. Um, yeah. So when we say like, I mean, there are like now like ever more the care became. Uh, such an issue, mm -hmm. um, not only as the subject of uh, feminist movement, but it is like like world uh, social or polit it's 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 a put on the mainstream agenda. Mm -hmm. Like how to do this? It cannot be solved with our public. Um, um, neither private. So mm -hmm. the, it's actually the commons who can do care you know, totally. Then, you know, what actually public uh, should do, could do mm -hmm. uh, these commons who have most capacity for care. Uh, it's my question. Question to government. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like uh, museums and art institutions can do a lot of exhibition about care, about the care. Mm -hmm. But this is at the cost of uh, actual caring mm -hmm. among, uh, workers and artists, you know, like in their yeah. extended, uh, relationship. Um, mm. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which I think, in a way, takes me to the question I had saved for last because we discussed this notion or under, multiple understandings also of what, are, what resources are. And so Bina, you're now talking also about how exhibition making can take away from where things are needed the most perhaps. Mm -hmm. And so this takes me to the question of um, funding and sustainability, which mm -hmm. is something that we were discussing before the live stream. I wanted to ask you, it is something that I tend to ask a lot in this series because the importance of how things are structured at the level of infrastructure, the question of sustainability, funding streams, like mm -hmm. all of these things, I think have an incredible impact on curating. And oftentimes this is made invisible from the broader conversation no? of, mm -hmm. we talk a lot about content, but then we tend to forget the invisible infrastructure that makes for possible no, the presentation or even mm -hmm. the existence of this content in the first place. So I wanted to ask you simply how you're thinking about the notion of sustainability or the sustainability of your work, of Casco's work, also through the lens of the commons. In this particular moment in time, Bina, you were saying you joined Casco in 2008, financial crisis, and now we've been traversing another crisis. So it is somewhat a cycle that you know, extends itself or closes itself, or we don't know. But basically, you've been traversing, yes, two crises by now. So I wanted to ask both of you how you're thinking about this sustainability and funding for the organization and, and your own work. <laughs> As we are writing, working on yeah. the mm. application. I mean, I'm just hesitant whether I would put question to the extreme. Like, if we lose this question, uh, if we lose this funding, yeah. could, we, could we and shall we continue or not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. I can imagine, actually. <laughs> uh, um, uh, let, let me put it like this. I think we we... We build, we build up our strength as an institution of commons. 
Uh, I mean, like we won't be ever perfect, uh, but we are far more common than uh, 2016. Um, we would be, I think, safe even if there's no institution that could hire us because we are already practicing. We are deep in our individual collective practice and there's a relationship that holds us. Mm -hmm. uh, but then um, at the same time, we, we have something genuinely to share uh, with, uh, with other commons and, and the public. So in order to do this well, uh, we need this and that resource. Mm -hmm. uh, what we need now is a long-term subsidy that uh, <laughs> we are asking for, which we can invest uh, our, uh, which invest in um, communication matter and making things public. Um, if that doesn't work, we, I think, still should, if yeah, like to put it really practical, if money is less than what we ask for, then we should think of how to bring down the scale or number of projects that we are doing to invest in this communication. And so we, mm. we maintain and keep this connection with the public and mainstream institution. I think if our if we were in a position that we would just uh, disappear from the public, uh, then I think we didn't, um, we wouldn't have endured this during this process. Keep, keep uh, adjusting uh, and rethinking like, our work in relation to art and the commons and art and institution. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, nothing to add for now. Okay. Well, then I just want to thank you so very much for tonight. Our time is up already. It was very quick, but um, thank you for sharing so generously and openly. I really appreciate it. Um, I see some comments that are coming uh, from people who are were watching this that thank you also for this for for making it oh, so nice. good so thank no, you but so yes yeah. thank, but thank you Ilaria for having us <laughs> yeah and, and yeah and thanks to everyone that is is tuning in and watching yeah um can I make a little plug of course because um Costco is going to have a like a new website um, at the uh, mid end of May. And um, yeah, we're really happy to share it. Um, so those that are watching now or like watching in the future can can have a look then and like stay updated with what we're doing because we'll be able to share much more clearly um, how like dynamic and precious these projects are that we're um, part of and investing in. So well, but, yeah, yeah, thanks. Thank you. We look forward to seeing that uh, going live. Um, so thank you so very much to both of you again. Yeah, and, and thanks, uh, Nina. Yes. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, I just want to remind those who are still watching that in case you have any follow-up questions or anything, we're always very happy. I say this all the time at the end of the talks. We are happy to act as a bridge. Uh, if you have questions mm -hmm. or anything that you may want to share with Stacy and Bina, so I'm just going to show here again the email address that is open for everybody for feedback, thoughts, questions, and so on. And here also we will publish the recording of this talk and we will announce the next speaker, which our guests that will join us in May. So again, Bina, Stacy, thank you so very much. Uh, have a good rest of your day. And thank you everybody for, for watching and being with us today. Take care and thanks a lot. <laughs> and everyone who listened to and safety. <laughs> <laughs> bye. Okay, bye.